Good morning, everyone. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on the Care of the Extremely Low Birth Weight Infant. We're so pleased this morning to have Mindy Morris as our faculty presenter. Mindy has worked in neonatal intensive care units for nearly 30 years. Her current role is as neonatal nurse practitioner and the coordinator of the Extremely Low Birth Weight Infant Program at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange, California. She's a passionate advocate for quality improvement and the implementation of evidence-based practice. She's a faculty member for the Vermont Oxford Network Quality Improvement Collaborative on the Optimizing the Care of the Micro-Premature Infant. She's a published author, participates in ongoing clinical research, and is a nationally recognized presenter and consultant. Mindy, thanks so much for being with us today and welcome. Mindy, we don't hear you. Mindy, make sure you have your mic on and unmute your phone. Still no sound. Hang on, everyone. We're having a few technical difficulties. Mindy, we, we still don't hear you. Um, check your check your mic button on your computer if you could. Happy Nurses Week to everyone there, too. I can see some nice uh, greetings from everyone. So sorry for the problem. We had a sound check earlier and everything was fine, but something Mindy is must have pushed a wrong button somewhere, so hang on. We are still here, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Still having a little bit of trouble. For those of you that want to um, talk on the phone, if you go up under more, 
And then you'll see under settings, it will give you a phone number to call. Just call in that phone if you're having any trouble hearing me right now. Uh, the webinar has not started yet. I'm so sorry. We're having technical difficulties on, on our presenter's end, so we're working on that. Just stay tuned, and we probably will start over again so we, the recording comes through clearly. Hope everyone is... Having a lovely Nurses Week for those of you that are nurses. We really appreciate you tuning in for today's webinar. always hate when we have these uh, technical difficulties, one of the risks of uh, doing online education, but I'm sure we'll get it resolved soon. Thank you very much, Kim Duncan, for listing the phone number. Appreciate that in case you want to listen on your phone instead of your computer. Sorry, everyone. Stay tuned. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Mindy, is that you? Yeah, we'll go back to the old system of using the telephone. Okay, I'm going to start over. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Again, good morning, everyone. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on the care of the extremely low birth weight infant. Mindy Morris is our faculty presenter this morning, and Mindy has worked in neonatal intensive care units for nearly 30 years. Her current role is as neonatal nurse practitioner and the coordinator of the Extremely Low Birth Weight Infant Program at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange, California. She's a passionate advocate for quality improvement and the implementation of evidence-based practice. She is a faculty member for the Vermont Oxford Network Quality Improvement Collaborative, optimizing the care of the micro-premature infant. She's a published author, participates in ongoing clinical research, and is a nationally recognized presenter and consultant. Thanks, Mindy, so much. And again, sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. Thanks, Kathy. Yes, I apologize for the technical difficulties. My computer said my mic was working and had me astounded, but you guys couldn't hear me. So we'll go to the old school system of the telephone. Um, and I'm probably going to speak fast today, especially knowing that uh, we're already behind. But the good news is it's recorded. So not that you want to go back and listen to me again, but at least that opportunity is there if I speak too quickly over something. I am not going to go through the objectives. You have those uh, in the handout, so you can read through those. Um, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures to uh, notify you of. Today, as you can imagine, it would be difficult to cover all of the LBW care in less than an hour. 
uh, and even less than that now. So briefly, we're going to talk about some ELBW outcomes, some delivery room considerations, and then evidence for uh, nutritional, respiratory, and neuroprotective care of these babies. In the U.S. each year, there are about 450 to 500,000 preterm births, and those are the babies born less than 37 weeks. And it's a less than 12% preterm birth rate for the U.S. Um, right now. And for the ELBW population, so those babies born less than 28 weeks or less than 1,000 grams birth weight, it's less than 1% of the babies that are born um, at this age. But we know that these babies have a prolonged hospitalization, have high risk for complications, and these, the, these complications for prematurity really is still the number one cause of death in children less than five years of age. So it's an important uh, population to focus on. We know the major risk factors for preterm delivery are uh, moms that have uh, multiple uh, children, so twins, triplets, history of a previous preterm delivery or a maternal stress or infection during uh, pregnancy, smoking or use of illicit drugs, and then extremes in maternal age, either young moms or moms over 35. So if you look at data on outcomes for extremely low birth weight infants, and both of these studies were from um, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Both had over 4,000 babies included in the study, and they were both five-year periods of time. You can see they weren't published until three to five years after that time frame. Um, but if you look at the survival rate, it really didn't change all that much in that two, five-year period uh, segment. And um, survival rate certainly has improved over the last couple of decades, but this five-year segment, it was pretty steady. I think it's really important to look at the second graph, which not only shows a uh, survival rate, but also talks about survival without morbidity. And the morbidities that they were looking at are uh, the common ones that we see with this population. So chronic lung disease, or BPD, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, or PVL, um, necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, nosocomial infection. Um, and you can see that while survival rates are pretty good for, say, a baby born of 25 weeks at around 75%, 20% of those babies survive without one of those comorbidities. And it's those comorbidities that we really need to focus on. If you look at this information, again, over 5,000 infants and looked at between 18 and 22 months of age, you can see that at this time frame, only 16% of these babies were unimpaired, which means they had a Bailey score of greater than 85. 22% in mild impairment and 22% with moderate to severe impairment. What I think is most striking from this information is that 40% of these babies had passed away by 18 to 22 months. And again, that gets back to complications of prematurity being the number one cause of death in, in children less than five years of age. So how do we best take care of this population? Um, as Kathy mentioned, we do have an extremely low birth weight program. And um, in establishing that program, we, we wanted to think about how best to set up a program. Um, if you wanted to provide care that uh, provided a standardized best care possible aimed at improving the, these morbidities, so having less of these morbidities, what did the evidence show us? And, the FIB study was actually on VLBWs um, in California over about a 10-year period of time, and it looked at over 48,000 babies. And it showed that babies that were born at a center of a high, higher level of care and a higher volume reduced mort mortality, which to me that just makes intuitive sense, that the more you do something, the better you are at it. And this sort of put in place this concept of a team-based approach. Gary's study um, showed that if you, you he used three evidence-based practice changes early in the management of the ELBW population and showed that standardized application of the evidence would improve outcomes as well. And then the Chow study from 2003 showed that an approach to oxygen management by a dedicated team can have an impact on major morbidities. They were specifically targeting severe ROP and reducing um, laser surgery for this population. But really, I think a, a little gem within this study is that they used a specific team to care for this bab uh, these babies in a certain period of time to reduce the likelihood of development of uh, retinopathy of prematurity. So from that, we um, sort of set our core concepts of how we want to develop our program, which is to have a specially trained team of a multidisciplinary team talent 
that took care of these babies as a cohesive team. We also wanted to uh, develop a standardized way to take care of these babies, so a uniform approach and how we were going to implement the evidence. And then also a location to care for them that was uh, developmentally appropriate. So when you talk about the beginning uh, to take care of the ELBW baby, and we're going to talk about uh, delivery room management, before that we should talk about prenatal consultation. Um, and all prenatal consults should really share similar information. It should, regard, uh, should matter very little who is actually performing the consultation, but the information should be the same um, regardless of which physician or which team is doing it. And ideally, it would be a team approach to um, providing consultation to these families with having more than the neonatologist involved, having nursing, possibly respiratory, and possibly social services involved. Um, we should conduct the consultations knowing what national outcomes are, but we really should know what the outcomes are in your center too, and having those open and honest dialogues about what the potentials are for delivering at certain um, terms of gestation. And then we should make sure that we're clear and understand what the family expectations are and so that we can appropriately provide support for their decisions. So when we talk about delivery room management, it's really important that we remember for delivery room management and really for NICU management what environment these babies started from and where they were intended to stay for the next several weeks. It's warm, it's fluid filled, it's very supportive and gentle. All movements are slow and supported. It's quiet. There's only muted sound heard as it's attenuated by the uterine walls. And it's dark. And it goes from that environment to more of this environment, where it's no longer dark, it's no longer fluid-filled, supportive. It's now invasive. It's often loud. It's often very bright. There's many times um, several hands manipulating the baby at any one time. Um, many times they're um, they're definitely exposed. Sometimes their movements are restricted. Um, they have invasive lines and tubes, and for the first time, they feel gravity. They feel gravity simply by being laying in the bed, but all of the weight of all of this apparatus that we add to them also um, makes them feel gravity. So the initial stages of care, um, this golden hour, you know, it's really likened to the first hour of care in a combat scene or in trauma care or an emergency department. And that's where we've incorporated this golden hour into our delivery room management. Well, what happens in that first hour really does determine the outcome. And we certainly need to provide resuscitation with a highly skilled and coordinated team. And we need to do this in a supportive and controlled manner for the baby as well. So preterm infants must overcome the alterations in gas exchange and the retention of lung fluid, and um, as all newborn babies do, as they transition from the uterine environment. But the preterm baby must do this in background of surfactant deficiency, of inadequately developed lungs and inadequately developed airways, and a lack of a respiratory drive. The goal in the delivery room resuscitation should be to use the least amount of intervention necessary to support normal gas exchange while minimizing the potential for future lung injury. So that really means more use of CPAP with fewer vol uh, volume ventilation breaths as able. It's important to um, identify what intervention they need and what level of support and to deliver that uh, in, a, in an efficient manner. The living room quality improvement has really been a popular QI movement for many statewide and um, statewide collaboratives and also through Vermont Oxford Network's Quality Improvement Collaboratives. And many of these uh, collaboratives provide toolkits for participants who are participating um, with guidance to, for practice recommendations on how to implement the best, uh, best evidence practice. In California, um, 25 hospitals joined the delivery room quality management with a common goal of improving the quality of delivery, uh, excuse me, improving the quality of care in the delivery room with the belief that there was evidence that supported a change in practice was necessary. And the toolkit for um, the California Collaborative is available to anyone at their website. It's the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative. So it's cpqcc.org, and that toolkit's available um, for anyone to access. You don't necessarily need to be a member. And much, much of the focus is on standardizing teamwork and improving communication between the team. 
by using things like briefing before deliveries, debriefing following delivery, sim similar to the NRP recommendations so you can assess the team performance, um, standardi standardizing the roles of the participants, and um, really delivering a high level of skill and communication so that the teams work quietly, efficiently, and organized together. We know that a few years ago um, in the delivery room that for respiratory management in the LBW, it typically included elective intubation as a routine approach. But we also know that many uh, randomized control trials have now demonstrated that these ELBW babies can complete fetal to neonatal transition successfully by the use of lung recruitment uh, strategies in the delivery room, such as use of T-piece resuscitators and CPAP. And they can transition without a need for intubation and surfactant. Many of them can. So it's really important um, for the early application of CPAP within the first 60 seconds of life and the ability to maintain that CPAP without breaking the seal. We know that ventilation is um, still common in delivery room resuscitations, and, um, and sev certainly several of these babies still require intubation um, and surfactant administration. But we do want to try to avoid manual breaths um, especially high tidal volume breaths as much as possible because even a few high tidal volume breaths can start to um, implement the cascade of an inflammatory response causing chronic lung disease. And it's important in the delivery room to begin our basic care or really our neuroprotective care in the delivery room with proper positioning from the start, nesting the baby in a slightly flexed position with the head in a midline position, uh, minimizing exposure such as noise and light, and being cautious for overhandling the baby, paying attention that not everybody has a their hands on the baby at one time. Um, and some places are actually moving to one care provider um, providing constant containment during uh, delivery room and during admission. Certainly limiting the time with the draft isolate open and working quickly and efficiently for a smooth transition from LND to the NICU. We know that one of the first steps in um, early on in the management of these babies in the delivery room is thermoregulation and, and attempts to prevent uh, cold stress. We know that these babies lose heat quickly after delivery um, when they're transferred to that cooler environment that's no longer the warm, fluid-filled environment. And preterm infants are at greatest risk for cold stress, which can have an effect on uh, blood sugar, oxygenation, and acid-base balances. So focusing on thermoregulation is one of the most important early steps in the delivery room management. Um, and we know that babies lose heat based on these four um, methods that we've learned about uh, from long ago. Conduction, that's uh, direct contact with a colder surface and the reason that we need to warm anything that comes into contact with these babies. Convection, which is due to air movement. Evaporation is the number one reason that ELBW babies lose heat and water and that's due to the cooling effect of, of the water loss on, on the skin. And then radiation, so that's heat that's lost via infrared rays um, due to body metabolism and heat to a cooler environment. So the need for our um, giraffes and uh, uh, other warming devices to be heated up and ready for the baby's delivery. If you think about why the ELBW is at, is at extreme risk for hypothermia or cold stress, it is because of their immature skin and their large body surface area. We know that the skin in these babies is both stru structurally and functionally immature, um, and there's diminished function of that barrier system. The epidermis is, is so poorly developed that in some areas it's only two to three cell layers thick, so it's easily brushed off by contact with bedding, clothing, or any mild friction, um, and this leads to increased thermoregulation issues and potential for infection. So anything that comes into contact, uh, especially the more immature the baby, there can be uh, skin denuding that occurs. And we also know that um, admission temperatures in the hypothermic range, so those babies that have been cold stressed, is an independent risk factor for increasing mortality in this population. So the NRP um, gives us some nice guidelines for 
reducing cold stress and thermoregulation in these infants. And these are all um, items that are easily placed on a checklist for the delivery room as well. I'm not going to go through them in detail. Um, they're in NRP, and you'll have them in the handouts here. So most people, when they're talking about care of the ELBW and you go from the delivery room, the first system that is discussed is respiratory. But I'm going to talk about nutrition next because I can guarantee you that none of us are going to uh, overlook the respiratory needs of this population once they, um, once we're in L&D with them or once they reach our NICUs. But sometimes we do overlook nutrition as being an essential component early on in the management, and I'm hope, I hope to show you why I think it is. We know that during fetal life that obviously nutrition is uh, supplied continuously and that these um, extremely low birth weight babies don't have the time for accrual of the stores of fat and protein that they need. Um, it's been widely demonstrated that these babies are growth restricted by the time they leave our NICUs. They don't start growth restricted, but the, by the time they leave our NICUs, they are. And the prevention of this growth restriction actually should begin at birth. Um, so when those babies are discharged growth restriction, 30 to 40 percent of them are still growth restricted at 18 to 22 months of age. So it's not something that is um, overcome very quickly. And the AAP states that growth should approximate that growth of the normal fetus. We know that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, although these babies are at a high level of illness at times and they uh, have a lot of other needs that we're focusing on, that inadequate nutrition really tends to be the predominant cause of the growth failure. So we need to recognize that optimizing nutrition is really one of the most important steps in the early management of the ELBW baby. It's not a special machine or medication, but it's just providing the essentials as they would have been provided naturally in utero. And it really establishes a pattern for this child's entire future. We know that um, what we do nutritionally in the first few hours of life impacts the rest of their life and that there are significant consequences when it comes to growth failure for neurodevelopmental outcomes. If you look at this, uh, the bar graph on the left, uh, this is a study from Clark looking at uh, the lighter bar, the higher bar, is what fetal growth would have been in utero. So you can see at the 24-weeker, an average of uh, 10 grams, 10, 12 grams per kilo per day growth, a 28-weeker, 20 grams per kilo per do, uh, day growth. And then the darker bar is what was actually achieved in these NICUs. So you can see they had less than half of what the typical in utero growth would have been. And that's to target that AAP recommendation of matching fetal growth. So um, that's, that's something that we're still far from reaching. And the charts on the right, if you look at those, it shows the impact of growth failure on neurodevelopmental outcome. The top line shows weight in grams per kilo per day, and it fluctuates from 12 grams to 21 grams per kilo per day. And then you can see with those varied weight gains what your risk of cerebral palsy was, um, neurodevelopmental impairment, and if you look at the last line, rehospitalization. So clearly they're significantly um, improvement with better growth. And similarly, the chart at the bottom shows that same information with head circumference change, from a head circumference of just over half a centimeter a week to just over one centimeter a week, and the resultant uh, outcome for cerebral palsy and also um, neurodevelopmental impairment. So clearly, uh, improving growth improves outcomes. So how do we improve growth? Well, one of the first things that we want to do is we want to avoid metabolic shock. Um, and again, it's imperative that we recognize how quickly time goes by. And we really should have a focus of a need to deliver nutrition to the CLBW population within an hour of birth. 30 minutes would be optimal, but certainly within an hour of birth, they should be receiving nutritional intake. Um, again, we know that they're immediately catabolic and they don't have those reserves or fat or protein stores as they would have accrued in utero. They have very high caloric and protein needs that we need to supplement as soon as possible. And they have a relatively high metabolic resting um, rate uh, with 50 to 60 kcals per kilo um, per day 
need resting metabolic rate. That would mean if nothing was happening um, by them or to them. We know that the rate increases by 15 kcals per kilo per day for any activity, and that may not necessarily mean that the baby's being active. That may be the activities that we are providing to the babies. So, um, and certainly other things increase metabolic demand as well, such as cold stress, which is another 10 kcals per kilo per day. So we really need to try to target and achieve these resting metabolic rates at minimum. And how do we do that? Well, we know that early on in the care we're not able to deliver sufficient calories and nutrients via the enteral route. So TPN and the parenteral route um, is, our, is essential. And that's really one of the main factors to the change in the survival rate for these babies as well, is our ability to customize TPN and to really d deliver good nutritional value in TPN. The human brain relies almost entirely on glucose substrate for metabolism. So glucose really has to be infused by the first hour of life, and certainly the goal would be within the first 30 minutes of life. Protein is, we know it's needed for growth and uh, prevention of poor neurodevelopmental outcomes, and it really should be administered as the first IV fluid. Um, if we don't administer protein early to help prevent that catabolism and that metabolic uh, shock, there's also a loss of total body protein. They lose 1% to 2% of endogenous protein every day that they only receive glucose without protein. So it's important we get it started in the first IV fluid. And uh, early amino acid administration has also been shown to demonstrate improved weight gain with fewer babies going home growth restricted as they've received early amino acid administration. And lipids, it's a, they're a great source of calories. We know that an essential uh, fatty acid deficiency, you need a, um, a certain amount of lipid administration. Um, but it's also essential for myelination. And myelination is that uh, process by a, a fatty layer of myel, uh, myelin sheath that accumulates around each of the nerve cells that allows those nerve cells to transmit in information faster, and it allows for more complex brain processing. So it's really important that we get lipids started within the first 24 hours of life. We know that early in ongoing parental nutrition is essential, but if we are only providing parental nutrition, we're not really taking into account the effect of fetal amniotic fluid had on the developing the GI uh, structural and functional integrity of the GI system. And enteral feeds, in, uh, by starting with trophic feeds, they have has direct and indirect effects on the development of the GI tract. It, um, the GI tract in the fetus is digesting and processing that amniotic fluid, and it actually provides about 15% of fetal nutrition. But more importantly, it provides growth factors, and it uh, induces release of intestinal hormones and cytokines. And in the last trimester, which is the trimester these babies miss and are in our units, the fetus actually swallows about 750 mLs per day of amniotic fluid, so it's a great volume. And the intestine, the fetal intestine, doubles in length between 25 weeks and 40 weeks. So that has to occur in our NICU, and we need to support that it starts to occur immediately by getting trophic feed started as soon as possible. We know that in the first few days of life, uh, the first week of life really, that enteral feeds are not going to provide a great deal of true caloric and nutritional value, but the value that it provides to the intestinal development is, is so important to the future success of tolerating feeds and getting these babies on full feeds and appropriately nutritionalized early. Um, it's going to stimulate, trophic foods will stimulate gut and intestinal motility and maturity, it shortens time to full feeds, possibly decreasing length of stay, and it doesn't increase the risk of NEC. Many studies have shown that it decreases the risk of NEC to begin with trophic feeds. So when we begin to feed these babies, we want to feed um, with breast milk. Mom's milk obviously is our first choice. If uh, we don't have mom's milk available, then certainly donor milk, breast milk would be our uh, option. Only Breast milk, whether it be mom's or donor, compared with formula, has shown to have a decreased incidence of NEC. And we want to begin feeds with these trophic feeds to, uh, for gut maturity and uh, stimulation. But we also want to feed utilizing a standardized feeding guideline. We know that standardized feeding guidelines certainly reduces the variability in feeding practice, 
um, but it also reduces the risk of NEC and um, achieves full feeding volume sooner. This is just an example of what our feeding guideline looks at. It's by no means a very aggressive guideline, um, and it's actually in the process of being revised. But I think what's important about using a guideline, again, is to decrease the variability, but also the standardization that can occur with using a feeding guideline, such as putting standardized process for when fortification added, and maybe most importantly, of when that central line is going to come out. One of the other things in talking about uh, feeds is just I want to mention colostrum uh, as our first feed. Ideally, colostrum would be our first feed. It is a transition from intrauterine to uh, extrauterine nutrition. It provides for growth, maturation, and protection. Moms begin producing in about 14 to 16 weeks. And it's more like amniotic fluid in composition than human milk. It contains 13 growth factors that help stimulate the lining of the intestinal, intestinal mucosa. Um, and these growth factors are also absorbed systemically and can affect growth of distal organs as well. We know um, that it's really important to actually use colostrum as soon as we have it, hopefully for feeds, if not for feeds, certainly for colostrum swabbing or oral immune therapy, which is a theory based on successful adult treatments of oral cytokine absorption through the buccal cavity. Um, and use of colostrum swabbing can possibly protect the uh, infant from pathogens that cause NEC by absorbing the cytokine and uh, immunoglobulin antibodies through the buccal tissue from the colostrum. But that's also one of the reasons why it's really important for it to be our first feed as well, so that absorption occurs through the intestinal mucosa too. And it's a great way to um, get the parents involved early. Certainly if we uh, let moms know that as soon as colostrum is available that the baby's going to receive it, that increases the desire to pump sooner um, and hopefully get that breast milk uh, supply started. But certainly it's a great way for parents to get involved in care by, by providing the colostrum swabs themselves. So just before I talk about respiratory, I'll say that um, with a focus on nutrition and uh, nutritional outcomes in the care of the EOBW, by incorporating some of these practices into place, our extremely low birth weight program has been uh, up and running for five years now. And we've actually been able to reduce, uh, reduce growth restriction in these babies. Um, less than a third percent we've reduced in the five-year average by 66% reducing growth restriction. And those babies growth restricted less than the 10th percentile, which is both weight and head circumference less than the 10th percentile. Over the five years, our average is a 45% reduction. Um, by taking these, these concepts and this evidence about nutritional support into practice. So prevention of chronic lung disease, or BPD. We know that uh, BPD is a complex pulmonary disorder, and it's characterized by lung inflation, lung injury, and that leads to an abnormal repair mechanism. And the most common accepted di uh, definition is oxygen requirement at 36 weeks of uh, just correct gestational age. We know it's an uh, inflammatory cascade that's initiated within the lung, which causes the lung to release cytokines, proteases, and free radicals that uh, continue to proliferate this inflammatory cascade and lead to pulmonary and lung development damage. And not all of the causes of the inflammatory cascade are, are respiratory in origin. It is math, uh, multifactorial and can be by anything that causes an inflammatory cascade, such as inflammation um, from infection or NEC. But we do tend to think about respiratory causes as being um, the main focus of reduction in chronic lung disease. And we know it's a very costly disease, not only in terms of comorbidities, but also on developmental outcomes and the need for rehospitalization. The SUPPORT trial, which came out in 2010, which was a randomized multi-centered uh, trial, babies were from 24 to 27 and 6 7 weeks, and they either randomized to uh, CPAP in the delivery room or intubation and surfactant within an hour of life. And the outcomes, the main major outcomes that they looked at were of death and BPD, and they were similar in both groups. 
However, there were less infants in the CPAP group that required intubation or prolonged ventilation or the need for postnatal steroids. And if you looked at the babies that were just 24 to 26 weeks, there was decreased mortality in the CPAP group for the babies 24 to 26 weeks. And there have been many other reports of CPAP success and less need for invasive ventilation and less risk of chronic lung disease. And the Cochrane database certainly supports CPAP as our main ventilation strategy for this population. So due to uh, limited time and um, increasing use of CPAP, I'm just going to focus on the use of CPAP today. Um, we know that CPAP is, uh, was first described actually in 1971 in the use of babies with respiratory distress syndrome, and it's the application of positive pressure to the airways. It increases functional residual capacity and reduces work of breathing. It improves static lung compliance and improves the lung volume. It reduces airway resistance. It improves the VQ matching by allowing easier circulation around open alveoli. And then it reduces the incidence of BPD, the incidence of ventilator days, and the incidence of complications associated with intubation. Certainly any time that we are applying uh, any ventilation method, there's risk of complications in, with uh, positive and expir uh, expiratory pressure, there is a risk of pneumothorax. So we want to watch for increased oxygen need, increased work of breathing, and certainly get a chest x-ray if, if suspected. Nasal obstruction can also occur, occur and usually this is mechanical. Um, we need to re remember that these babies are obligate nose breathers. They breathe through their nose. So the prongs must be in the correct position. Any edema from trauma can cause an obstruction as well. So we should only use the nasal tip uh, aspirators to section, not a catheter, so that we're not causing trauma and causing occlusion of that nares, which would um, cause the mechanical obstruction. And then making sure that we are providing uh, adequate humidification of the nasal CPAP system. These babies seem to... Uh, get a lot of abdominal distension on CPAP, so we should have an uh, OG tube gravity at all times, uh, venting it an hour, uh, begin venting it an hour after feeds. And then many times, um, it seems like some babies uh, develop more gastric distension than, than others, but certainly going in every uh, 30 to 60 minutes to aspirate the air out of the belly will, will help as well. And then providing um, protective methods to prevent nasal tissue injury, uh, erosion, or um, septal injury. And this means using skin barriers. If you use effective skin barriers, the, the skin barrier itself can, if you're using prongs, can actually hold the prongs in place. Rather than the uh, prongs being as fixed in the nares, the skin barrier can hold the uh, prongs in place. And certainly with prongs, there should be an air cushion. At no point should the prongs be touching the septum. Uh, there should be uh, a measure of error between the prongs and the septum itself. And this study up here recommended alternating interfaces between prongs and um, mask. And some places do that. Uh, personally, we provide, uh, we just use the prongs. Um, we don't like to take the babies off CPAP. Once they're on CPAP, we want to maintain that FRC as long as possible, so removing the prongs is not, um, not ideal. So some tips for CPAP, really standardizing practice. And the best way to standardize practice is choose one modality, whether it be prongs or mask, um, if you're using prongs, which prongs, which mask, which CPAP device, but choose one modality. Again, standardizing care, and the more you do something, the better you're at, you are at it, so picking one device. Also choosing a strategy. Uh, what's your comfort level in PEEP? Do you always extubate to a PEEP of five to six? The, are you comfortable using seven? How about eight? Um, but knowing what your range is. When do you use nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, or do you use it at all? And then how long do you stay on CPAP? Do you have a clinical measure that you must meet so they are in room air for a certain period of time that you take them off? Uh, some people uh, looked at the studies in animal models that have shown that CPAP uh, helps pulmonary growth, so they leave babies on CPAP longer um, with the thought of lung growth and pulmonary growth happening. And then when you come off, how do you come off? 
Do you just come off directly? Do you transition to nasal cannula? But what's the method? But standardizing that approach. Certainly positioning the baby prone when possible um, helps to give the chest wall stability. And this isn't an easy task. It sounds like it would be to put the baby prone, but the, to keep the CPAP uh, device in place, maintain your seal, and uh, not cause injury, it really is a two-person job. Two nurses, two RTs, a nurse and an RT, a nurse and a parent, a nurse and a devel developmental specialist, but someone that can hold the device in place and uh, safely change the baby's position. Making sure you're using the appropriate size and position of the prongs. And um, this is something that may change over time. If you use CPAP for a long period of time and the baby's growing, then the size of the device you need may change as well. And then um, making sure that we deliver the appropriate measured CPAP from 5 to 7 and that it's a humidified system at 36 to 37 degrees. And we need to optimize delivery, and that means using a chin strap. Again, the babies are obligate nasal breathers. However, if the mouth is open, we're not delivering CPAP. So the mouth needs to be closed to appropriate del delivery of the PEEP, which means that we need to use a, a chin strap and we need to use the skin protective devices that minimizes leak around uh, the nares as well. Suction only is needed, and again, that's suctioning with the bulb tip aspirator, not a suction catheter so that we're not causing trauma and edema. And then comfort measures, bringing in those neuroprotective strategies, the positioning, um, the comfort measures. We know that the, the ELBW baby has really poor control of their breathing pattern, um, and that's typically manifested as apnea, bradycardia, and desaturations. And the number, the actual number of the apnea, bradycardia, or desaturation episode may be less important than the character of it and then the intervention that was required to address that episode. Our definition of apnea is from 1969, and the actual definition was a non-breathing interval in which a, uh, an infant cannot tolerate without bradycardia and cyanosis. Then it follows it up by saying for large infants it may be 20 seconds, and it may be as few as 5 seconds for smaller infants. So when we think of apnea, we typically think of a pause in breathing for 20 seconds. But clearly the definition says for smaller infants it may be as low as five seconds. And I think if I think we see that every day in our care of this population. You can see a baby that has a lot of desaturations, um, and they may actually be, we call it periodic breathing, but that may be apnea for five, six, ten seconds that's causing the baby to desaturate and eventually will cause bradycardia if the uh, breathing cessation does not pick up. And it's really unrealistic to think that the ELBW baby is going to be apnea-free. Um, so what do we do to manage apnea? Well, uh, strategies really have changed very little over the last few years, and it is uh, management with CPAP and then methylxanthines or caffeine. We know that methylxanthine reduces frequency of apnea prematurity and uh, the need for mechanical ventilation and decreases ventilator days. It also decreases failed extubations especially in the extremely low birth weight population. And in the study of VLBWs, it reduced the rate of BPD and death in this population. So all of that sounds um, highly positive for using caffeine. Um, but obviously, a lot of times with these medications, we do worry about the long-term effects. So Schmidt and colleagues actually followed up that same study population and looked at their longer-term effects and showed that not only did caffeine help with staying off the ventilator, but also those babies that had received caffeine had less risk of, of CP as well. So I think I've shown you that some of the things um, with respiratory care really, again, is about standardization of that care, employing that evidence into practice in a consistent way. Uh, we tend to use a lot of checklists in our unit to make sure that, um, that care is standardized and using the best evidence. Uh, and this is an example of our extubation checklist, which helps to ensure that regardless of the time of day, that extubation will occur the same way. And you can see on this uh, line two is certainly to uh, make sure that we're on caffeine prior to extubation. And caffeine is actually on our admission checklist too. So it's something that we start on admission, but we make sure that we've uh, given a dose close to an extubation time as well. And if you look in the blue section, the extubation period, um, we, one of the strategies that we use, too, is to make sure that 
this baby is on CPAP prior to actually pulling the ET2 valve. So we certainly don't suction unless it's needed because we don't want to. We want to maintain FRC, and then we make sure that the baby's on CPAP before the tube actually comes out. And again, in an attempt to maintain FRC. And in um, the five years of our ELBW program, the five-year average improvement in our chronic lung disease rate has been a reduction of 24% over that five years um, by pulling this, these strategies, these, this evidence into place with the uh, with the consistent team. All right, now I'm going to move to neuroprotection for the extremely low birth weight infant. We're going to talk about prevention of IVH, um, but really shift this focus to neuroprotection, which um, if you look up the definition of neuroprotection by that uh, scientific journal of Wikipedia, um, it's defined as the relative preservation of neuronal structure and or function leading to neuroprotection. And I think that's a really good definition because it, it certainly would include the prevention of intraventricular hemorrhage, but it also includes the facilitation of neurodevelopment because it, it's preserving structure and function um, as neuroprotection. Inter IVH, we know that incidence uh, is high in the VLBW babies and even higher in the ELBW babies, especially with decreasing gestational age. The timing is typically within the first three days of life, which leads us to some of our neuroprotective strategies, focusing on the first three to seven days of life. And the cause of IVH is the the fragile, fragile constitution of the germinal matrix, and we're going to talk about that in more detail, and the inability of the newborn brain to auto-regulate blood flow to this region. The subependymal germinal matrix is the site of bleeding for an interventricular hemorrhage most typically, and it is because of the thin-walled vessels in this area. The germinal matrix has it's the um, site of growing neuronal and glial precursor cells. So neuronal or, neuronal or uh, brain cells and then glial. Glial cells are that support and protective cell structure that supports the neurons and protects it. So that's uh, all occurring in the subepidermal germinal matrix, which is located in the uh, floor of the lateral ventricle in that caudal thalamic groove. So the germinal matrix, again, it's very highly vascularized. There's a lot of uh, rich capillary network in this system, and those capillaries are very thin-walled. They don't have the tone that they need. And what's important for us to think about prevention IVH is not only um, are the vessels fragile in this area, but then also blood flow to this area is very poorly regulated. There's no ability for the infant to auto-regulate blood flow to this area. So anything that increases or decreases cerebral perfusion puts these fragile capillaries at risk. The factors for uh, causing IVH can be vascular, which we've talked about, the, the fragile capillary network, extravascular, which um, really that is about the vessels are fragile and then there's no parenchymal support in that area to protect those fragile vessels as well. And then the intervascular, and that's about the, the inability to auto-regulate. So anything that causes cerebral blood flow fluctuation, whether that be increased or decreased, and you can see the things listed there that do that, puts the baby at risk to, have a, to develop an intraventricular hemorrhage. We know that all of these factors can come into play in our NICU to increase the risk of IVH. And some of them are things that we can try to minimize and control for, but a lot of them are uh, care activities that we, we can control for. So when we look at trying to um, implement strategies to prevent IVH for a neuroprotective strategy, the couple of uh, groups published several years ago some potentially better practices to reduce brain injury or to reduce intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, it's starting with the antenatal care, which would be antenatal steroid administration, and then obviously focusing on delivery room management and that golden hour of care. Early management strategies, neutral head position, which we'll talk about in a second, minimizing pain and stress, 
thermoregulation, which we've already mentioned, as uh, cold stress being an independent risk factor for mortality and IVH. Limiting har harmful medications, which includes early limitation or non-existence of sodium bicarbonate use, and then late use of postnatal steroids. Respiratory management strategies strategies, and then potentially endomethacin uh, prophylaxis. And many imp uh, institutions have gone to developing a neuroprotection bundle with some of those potentially better practices, maybe all, maybe a few. Um, and if you think about this concept of using a bundle of care, we certainly do it with our central line bundles and in infection prevention strategies. But the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, defines a, a bundle really as a structured way of improving process and care um, by using a set, so three to five evidence-based practices that individually each one of those practices may not have a high level of evidence to support it being implemented individually, but collectively implementing those three to five uh, may prove to improve uh, patient outcomes. So this is just a simple neuroprotection bundle um, with use of a head midline strategy or a head neutral strategy. And studies were done back in the 1980s that actually looked at cerebral blood flow in neonates uh, related to positioning. And many, there are many, many studies done, and it, it's led to really the acceptance from a physiologic standpoint that implementation of a head midline position for the first 72 hours um, should be recommended, and that's related to the anatomy of the infant's brain with the veins being in this U-shaped anatomy that when the head is positioned to one side, an occlusion or obstruction of that jugular venous venial drainage system can occur on that same side, so the ipsilateral, ipsilateral side, and that leads to venous congestion, which subsequently could lead to vessel ru uh, rupture. And that area, again, around the germinal matrix is, is prone for that. So this is a simple um, neuroprotective bundle that can be put in place to um, provide headline mid-headline uh, mid strategy and then um, thermoregulation, minimizing pain and stress, and, again, limiting those harmful medications. I was uh, really fortunate enough a couple of months ago to see a presentation by Dr. Susan Hintz out of Stanford uh, where she was discussing her recent paper in uh, pediatrics looking at head ultrasound, cranial head ultrasound versus MRI for predictive neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, but she summarized these two EOBW studies that m really kind of brought it home to me. Um, we know that prevention of IVH is important, and we know that those babies that have severe IVH, grade 3, grade 4, at our, are at higher risk for neurodevelopmental outcome uh, problems. But these two studies, uh, and both of these studies, in the LGAN study, only, although only 6% of the babies that had a normal or negative head ultrasound ended up having a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, 38 of the 120 babies who had CP in this study, 38% of them had a normal or negative head ultrasound on all three of their neonatal head ultrasounds. Um, and then the Epipod study, although only 4% of the babies that had a negative head ultrasound had cerebral palsy at two or five years of life, of the one-third of the babies that had CP, none of them had an abnormal head ultrasound during their neonatal period. And actually, in that population, um, that study, at eight years, the babies between 24 and 28 weeks, 10% had a moderate to severe CP diagnosis, and they had negative head ultrasounds. So to me, that sort of brought it home that it really, although we have to prevent IVH, it really is about more than I, pre just prevention of IVH. We need to do more. And in, in the human brain, there are 80 to 100 billion neurons or brain cells in the brain, and they're born at a rate of over 250,000 per minute over nine months of gestation. So that last three months of gestation is in our NICU. And that's the brain cell itself. But how do we make them connect and talk to one another? And that's synaptogenesis. And the synapse, which allows uh, chemical and electrical activity go, to go from one brain cell to the other, at its peak, there are 15,000 synapses on every neuron. So that was 80 to 100 billion. 
So that's 1.8 million new synapses per second between two months gestation and then the first two years of life. And the EOBW loses that opportunity to have normal neuronal and synaptogenesis occur because it has to occur in our unit. And literature certainly indicates that that the neonatal experience in our NICUs ha impacts future behavioral patterns and outcomes. Um, so neuroprotective focus to protect the brain and also to allow its development um, is important. And this, this topic was really covered very well uh, a couple of months ago. Dr. Raylene Phillips did a presentation for Dandelion. I would, if you didn't uh, listen to that webinar, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's excellent. It's called Neuroprotection of the Developing Brain. Um, and she uh, has gone into great detail, which um, it's a very good presentation. But what we can do, we can focus on sleep. We know that sleep cycles begin between 26 and 28 weeks. Um, we know that sleep is important for creation of memory and maintenance, importantly, of brain plasticity. That's your capacity to change and adapt and learn in response to your environment and new learning experiences. And that sleep patterns um, for the fetus sleeps about 20 to 22 hours a day. If you think about the babies in your unit, I, I think it would be difficult to imagine that they have the ability to sleep at least 20 hours a day. We know that REM sleep is essential. Um, for development of all the systems, and that dep uh, deprivation of sleep certainly leads to disordered sensory development um, and smaller brain development because of not allowing that connectivity to occur and irritability. I think we can all probably attest to uh, sleep deprivation leading to de uh, irritability. So as caregivers, we should promote and protect sleep and try to um, be respectful of REM sleep and not wake babies in REM sleep. Hearing, we can protect um, hearing. We know that fetal hearing begins at about 24 weeks, processing at 30 weeks, and orientation to sound around 34 to 35 weeks. We know that the infant grows hearing mother's respirations, heart rate, GI system, speech. She, uh, the baby can differentiate mom's voice from other women's voices just based on pitch, intensity, and timing patterns. But they can only do that if the background noise is limited. Exposure to sound too early has been suggested to interfere with the ability to process um, not only auditory stimulation, but it's also associated with language delays, irritability, poor state regulation and self-calming ability, and poor sleep and growth patterns, which all of this has a possibility to lead to sensory integration dysfunction. And as again, as the background noise increases, the ability for the baby to focus decreases, and you know that's sort of that tuning out period where sometimes you see the infant fatigue and heart rate variability with desaturations, et cetera. So as caregivers, we certainly want to um, speak at low levels and try to quiet ambient noise, um, protecting the baby from speech as much as um, from noise as much as possible. But it is important for the baby to hear voices. So it's important for us to actually talk to the babies, not talk over the babies or around the babies, but actually talk to the babies as we're providing care techniques. And focusing on vision, it's uh, the last sensory systems develop and mature, and this happens in the dark. We know that early exposure can uh, lead to auditory pathway development problems. It uh, also can lead to problems with peripheral vision, motor coordination, wandering eyes, discontinent gaze, all of these problems can also lead to future challenges with school, social, and career successes. So it's important for us to protect vision, um, protect sleep cycles, which help protect vision, and protect the eyes from direct and bright lights throughout. It should be natural light that is the exposure when it's at an appropriate time. And this should uh, start in the delivery room. We should be protecting the eyes from the bright lights in the delivery room. And then we can focus on um, family and incorporating the families as partners in care. How can the families um, partner with us to achieve the best outcomes? We need to respect that maternal and paternalistic instinct. Sometimes parents have gut, uh, a gut feeling about something. They know the little nuances and subtleties in the baby's behavior, and we need to listen to them to recognize changes earlier. They are that constant in the baby's life, and um, we need to engage them in care as soon as possible and, and truly partner with them. 
and they can help us with our quality and safety. They certainly can provide valuable feedback on our systems of care, so we need to listen to them and partner with them. And one of the main um, important early activities for family involvement is obviously skin-to-skin -skin care. Um, it is a lot about protecting the brain and managing aspects of care to prevent injury, but it's also about nurturing brain growth and development. And skin-to-skin -skin is certainly one of those things that does help brain maturation and, and, and uh, neurodevelopment. And we need to incorporate it into our practice as soon as possible. And I think that's a focus for a lot of units to incorporate it early, but we also need to continue it throughout the hospitalization. It's not something that's good in the first month and it's not good after that. This is good every day in our unit. Um, and it certainly uh, increases not only brain maturation, but also breast milk production um, and state regulation and all of those things that are beneficial to the baby. So to summarize, and I apologize that this has gone a little late. I know we were a little late to get started. I hope um, that we can have some questions. Um, you know, a, a core team really invested in the consistent care of this population is really important. And with that consistency of the team, the culture of caregiving begins to change. And I give the um, success of implementing our extremely low birth weight program and the, the various evidence-based practices we've taken into that program and our results to our interdisciplinary team because really they're the key for the success. Uh, and I haven't disclosed a lot about our program in depth, as certainly that would require a lot more um, time than we have. Um, we're also fortunate enough that we will be able to share the development of our program and our results in greater detail as a manuscript um, has been accepted for publication in pediatrics, so that should be out in the next couple of months. Um, we really do believe that it's about focusing on the little things, so it really is the micromanagement of these micro-premature babies. It is about managing your fluids tightly, your oxygen delivery, providing that neuroprotective care and positioning and, and the teamwork. If, if you do enough small things right, big things can happen. That was said by John Wooden. We certainly, certainly believe that in the care of this population. You have to really think about that picture of the brain all of the time when you're delivering care and the challenges of neurodevelopment. It really is every minute of every day in that unit that makes an impact on how this baby is going to, is going to develop. And it starts um, obviously from the beginning, but it's also the maintenance throughout the entire uh, stay in our NICUs. And utilizing tools, checklists or guidelines, care maps, those types of things to help support uh, team consistency and team practice. And then certainly partnering with the family in, in providing care. So that quickly ends uh, my presentation. And I, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions that might come in. Mindy, thank you so much. That was just a super presentation, so much good information. Um, I'm sure people have lots of questions, and it's been a lot to take in, but we're going to open up now for a few minutes of questions. If you can type your question in the chat area, uh, Mindy will do her best to answer as many questions as she can. So Mindy, here's the first one. Can you elaborate on the use of um, bicarb as a harmful med? Okay, thanks. So bicarb, sorry. Okay, right. Um, sodium bicarbonate is, is extremely hyperosmolar, so it causes uh, a great deal of fluid shift. And it is, um, there are a couple of articles out there, but uh, it's certainly an independent risk factor for increasing the risk of IVH based on its hyperosmolarity. Hyper I see there's another question that says, how do you treat acidosis early? I guess the, the first answer to that is, um, how do you define acidosis? We know that these babies are coming from an extremely um, acidotic environment in utero, so they've had been exposed to um, that pH and that uh, PaO2 for that entire time. Um, I, I don't want to say that we allow permissive acidosis, but at the same time, um, our targeted blood gas parameters tend to start with a pH of 7.2.0. Um, however, when the pH drifts to uh, a little bit lower than that, we tend to monitor it and try to address it in other ways. Um, and I guess that is also one of the challenges with giving uh, sodium bicarbonate. It's, 
it's sort of a temporary fix. Um, so unless you address the other issues that are potentially causing acidosis, and if it is, and and also it depends on the level of acidosis, but certainly babies that are profoundly acidotic, we need to rule out other potential causes such as infection or severe IVH or those types of things. And Kathy, I'm sort of being overwhelmed by the questions on the screen. Um, so if you could toss me a few, that would be great. Sure. <clears throat> Here's the next one. You talked about nutrition and growth, but do you think that the thermal care and protecting the neutral thermal environment can also impact growth? Sorry, one more time with that. You talked about nutrition and growth, but do you think that the thermal care and protection of the neothermal environment can also impact growth? Absolutely. I, I think there's so much to it. Obvious, it's easy to focus on uh, making sure that we're delivering the appropriate nutrients, and that's certainly an early focus and an important focus, but there are so many other things that impact growth from a metric per parameter, such as the weight, et cetera, but when you're thinking about brain growth and brain development, all of that comes into play. The, the thermal environment, um, the activity levels of the babies, how often are we disturbing them, all of that comes into play. Mindy, there's a question, kind of a follow-up on that, is if you're using the Neo Wrap, how long do you keep those in place? So we typically keep ours in place. Um, it's put on in the delivery room, and then it's on through umbilical line insertion, which hopefully is quite rapid and does not always include both a UA and a UVC. It certainly includes a UVC, but we um, may not put in a, a UA line, which decreases the time. But we actually admit to a warmed, humidified uh, isolate and so as soon as the lines are in and the, we, the humidity level and the temperature level in the isolate is adequate, we take the baby out. It's usually, I would say, about an hour. Great. There is a very common question that I hear um, about keeping neutral head positioning with CPAP and also during skin-to-skin. -skin. Do you have any specific strategies for that? Our uh, our neural bundle with neutral head position and um, that head midline position is for the first three days. So we, um, which was a, a very much a challenge to agree to this, but we don't do skin to skin for the first three days because we're also not weighing for the first three days. So if we're not making that big movement for uh, weight, we didn't think uh, doing standing transfer for skin to skin, we would eliminate it for three days. But even in the next four days, we try to still maintain a head neutral position. So our skin to skin may actually have the baby a little bit more sideline to the mom's uh, or father's chest than, than chest to chest. Um, and also head neutral really means not having the head at a 45 degree angle. So there are various tiny adjustments that can be made, especially with um, positioning devices that can get the baby fully contacted skin to skin with a parent that doesn't have the head uh, turned to one side. Great, great. Um, another question here, and I'm sure that we can all relate to this one, is working in large units and even in small units when the families and parents um, come in for a, for a time with the baby and maybe the baby has just fallen asleep. And, of course, especially if they've just traveled a long distance to get there, which in many places they do, how do you manage the, the pros and cons or the risk benefits of waking that sleeping baby and providing parent, good parent interaction time? So how do you balance that, and how do you educate the family to encourage that sleep protection? Well, that's a great that's a great question, and you're right. I think it's uh, something that's a challenge for every unit. Um, a couple of ways. Number one, I think flexibility is important. Um, we typically have care times that we think that the cares need to be done for the baby, um, and the 
it's great when we can have open communication with the families and know when they're coming in uh, so that we might be able to delay care times an hour, move them up an hour, delay them back an hour, um, but trying to coordinate that so that it fits the family schedule too because we there are many assessments we can make of the babies uh, without having those big care times or position changes, and we can wait and coordinate that with the family being there. Um, the other part of that too is skin to... I, I think we are learning more and more and more about skin to skin and how important it is for the development of these babies' brains. Um, there's so much more than we have time to go into today, but it is so important um, that when the parents are there and they are going to be there to provide ample time for skin to skin, so minimum of an hour, hopefully two, three, four hours, we should be putting the baby skin to skin. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think if, if, again, as you alluded to Dr. Phillips' presentations before, I think, in, and if you, and, and if anyone reads any of the, the articles that you cited there on that slide for skin to skin, um, it's pretty profound. The neurogenesis and the connectivity that happens, and the benefits of that during, um, then during skin to skin, and it's probably more valuable to allow that and even a slight interruption to whatever sleep cycle they were in to get the benefits of what happens during that, that touch time. I agree, and I think it's important that um, skin to skin is becoming a, uh, a medically recognized improvement as well. I, I think mm -hmm. when it, which it's been around for many years, but we uh, tended to be nursing driven and you know we noticed how well the babies behave. Those, we had some physiologic data, but now we're, we are learning more and more science behind it, and, and I think it's, you know, it's hugely valuable. I think um, one final one that I think is probably not easily answered, um, we can sometimes post a few Q&As later, is really the um, use of cycled lighting. And do you have a short answer for kind of what you guys do for providing cycled lighting in your unit? And is it weight-based, gestational age-based, or individual care? Well, that's a great question. And I wish I could provide you an answer, but uh, right now in our unit, we, we don't have um, – a set protocol. It's something that we are working on. We we do not have individual patient rooms. We have um, a couple of, patient, of individual rooms and then two four bed pods. We try to move our older babies um, that might be ready for more natural light exposure to a, that certain room, so that they're all sort of in the similar and and there are sh uh, windows and shades. So again, it's. The cycle lighting is about natural light exposure, not our artificial light. Um, so it's something that we're working on, but it's uh, also uh, something that re you know a lot of literature is coming out that it's it's an important tool that we need to implement at the later stages. I want yeah. to just add on one addendum question. Um, someone wants to know when you start skin to skin in low birth weight infants. So you did mention after three days, but do you have any gestational age requirements? No, no, the only requirement, um, there's very few exclusions, and our only real exclusion is less than three days of age. Uh, any other exclusions would be at a, a baby that's at an at extremely high level of illness, but that that's uh, not very common. But any other baby, we would encourage skin to skin after three days of life. And, and then, one last um, to the end, yeah, one, do you use and non-nutritive sucking for procedural pain management? Yes, absolutely. Uh, colostrum swabs are great for that. Non-nutritive, uh, yes, absolutely. And then, Mindy, will your article um, that's going to be soon published, um, there's been a couple questions about more specific things that you do. Um, so if, it, if your article addresses it, then I'm thinking we can refer people to that once it's available. But things like how long has your program been in use and your follow-up, does it include CP rates and change in CP rates? And then the other question related to your specific unit is whether or not you have a specific curriculum for training nurses. Most of that will be in the in the publication. It does talk about how we started the program and um, the various components of the program. 
the team training, which again, it's very much an interdisciplinary team, um, and, and the results. It does not have high-risk infant follow-up clinic data in it. It sticks uh, with results of outcomes at discharge. Um, there's, there's an extreme amount of data available, and so it's, uh, it, it, this is the first segment, hopefully. Um, if people have further questions, um, you can let us know, and we can place a um, place for people to get a hold of you to email if they'd like you to come and speak at their hospital, or or maybe come and, and answer a few of these questions about their practice specific things. Would you be willing to share a contact information um, on the website? Absolutely, sure. Okay. I will put and, and you can, you're feel free to say it now too, but I thought I would just ask that too. Okay. I, well, I think on the first uh, on the first slide it has my chalk email address, um, and um, but I can send another email address as well if that would be useful. Yeah, that'd be great. Wonderful. We did have another suggestion that someone would like you to do another webinar right away, Mindy, with all the information that so many people are having questions about. So. Again, you mentioned it was a tough topic to cover in one hour, but you've done a magnificent job, and we are so grateful for your expertise. Um, we have sev several dandelion products that I just wanted to mention quickly that are appropriate for the very low birth weight babies, starting with thermal line plastic hats. Um, we have a very low-cost, easy kangaroo um, device called the Kangaroo Cuddler that can help provide safety to those moms who may be drowsy, especially if they're, you know, tired from commuting and post-birth and all that, and they're, you know, want to kangaroo their babies for long periods of time. This will help any, you know, prevent any accidents. And we also have a brand new product called the Roo 2, which is made from a wonderful stretchy fabric and goes down low enough for those little teeny babies. So that's something else. There is a place in the evaluation if you want to request more information or samples of any of those products, we're happy to provide them. Now next, in order to receive your free CE, you are going to need to fill out the webinar evaluation. And in the chat area, you will soon click on or be redirected to the evaluation link um, or the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you will receive a link to download the CE certificate. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you will receive an email within the next few hours with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and a PDF of the slides. If you're viewing as a group, you must each log in to the evaluation form to get the CE. So we have many questions about people that listen as a group. That's absolutely great, but you're each individually going to have to log into that uh, the link that's right there now in the chat area and fill out the form with your own name and um, information number to get the CE. We hope you'll visit the Dandelion Medical web, uh, website for future webinars and also links to the recordings of our 24 previous webinars. We're, we just passed our two-year anniversary. We do have several by Dr. Phillips, as Mindy mentioned, one on neurodevelopmental care and one on kangaroo care, both of which were fabulous. Um, so I hope you have a great weekend. Mindy, thank you again so much. You were really absolutely terrific. And thank you to all the listeners out there to, for being part of another wonderful Dandelion webinar.